Amen. So good. Thank you, team. Good to be here. How's everyone doing? Well, before we get in, I'd like to honor our lead pastors, Damien and Julie. Thank you. Thank you guys for this opportunity to, um, to be here, to share the word with our congregation, to encourage our congregation. Thank you for the church that you've built that has been a blessing for me, for my family, and for, I'm sure, so many other people. So thank you guys. Um, so as you know, <laughs> yep, come on. So I'll be starting us off today. Uh, there's two other incredible leaders that are going to share with you. Uh, I have the privilege of warming you guys up. Um, as you know, we are going through the series Psalms and Songs for Life. Uh, the title of this message, if you care to know, is From Pit to Praise. I'm sure you'll get a sense of why in just a moment. Uh, let me just uh, grab my iPad. It's supposed to rotate when you twist it, but <laughs> it's not doing it today. Oh, there you go. Um, so the psalm that I chose to explore today is Psalm 40, and specifically I'll be focusing on verses 1 to 3. So let's read it right now, Psalm 40, 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. So just for some context, uh, Psalm 40 is considered to be a lament psalm. And by the way, you can guys take your seat. I'm sorry. <laughs> psalm 40 is considered to be a lament psalm. Uh, many scholars believe that David wrote this psalm um, during one of his exiles or maybe during the infancy of his reign as the king of Israel. And essentially what David is describing in these first few verses is this deep sense of suffering and deliverance from that suffering. And what I'd like to do today is just to point your attention to a few key elements within this passage. And the first element is the pit. So let's talk about the pit. Uh, David talks about God lifting him up from a slimy pit out of the mud and mire. So you can picture this sort of uncomfortable, kind of sticky situation that David is finding himself in. And what we know about David's life is that over the course of his rule, over the course of his life, he has faced many uncomfortable situations, many physical battles, physical trials, physical um, threats, literally, to his life. But what's interesting here is David is actually not talking about a physical challenge. He's not talking about a physical threat. But the pit that he is describing is actually sort of a metaphor for being in this state of deep distress and anguish as a result and as a consequence of personal sin. So he's in this slimy pit. He's stuck. He's overwhelmed. Perhaps uh, he's suffering emotionally. And how many of us can relate to that? Or how many of us have had moments like that in our lives? How many of us have been in this metaphorical pit where we just find ourselves in a place that we can't seem to get out of? Maybe you feel like you're in a pit right now. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe you just lost a job. Maybe you're in debt and you just can't seem to, to see a way out. Maybe it's a illness, addiction, depression, whatever it is. I'm sure many of us can relate to this image of being stuck in a place where we just can't seem to find a way out. But just like God delivered David, I believe he can deliver you and me from that terrible situation as well. Which leads me to the second part, which is praise. The second element is praise. Uh, it says, 
when God delivered David from the pit, it says, he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Such a contrast with what we just saw where David was in this miry clay, this sticky situation, this uncomfortable place, and all of a sudden he's standing firmly on a rock in a firm place. David gets delivered, and out of that deliverance, the only reaction for David is praise. It says in verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. So it really wasn't enough for David to get delivered. He chose to express his gratitude in song and in praise. And what a beautiful picture that is. And I believe that our response as Christians, every single one of us, should be exactly that. So whenever God does something significant in your life, our response should be to praise him, to express our gratitude towards him, to celebrate him. That's why we sing songs of worship every, every Sunday. At the beginning of each service, we sing, we start with praise and worship to celebrate, to set our eyes on Jesus, to set aside our circumstances and to thank God for the things that he's done, for who he is. And so now we talked about the contrast between the pit and being in the sticky situation and then being in a high place, in a high place where you're full of faith, full of praise. But how do you get from one situation, how do you get from that low point to then being on a mountaintop? How do you how do you get from that? And how, what can we learn from David's example? What does David do? What is his transition from the pit to praise? And I think the answer is actually at the very start of this chapter. It says, David waited patiently for the Lord. So the answer is actually waiting. David waited. But what's interesting is it's not just any kind of waiting. David wasn't just sitting there with his you know, with his arms closed and just waiting and counting down the days, counting down the hours. No, it's a very active kind of waiting that David is talking about here. And the reason that I know that it's an active kind of waiting is the word, the original Hebrew word that's used in this passage, the word for wait is actually kava. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But kava means to wait and to look for to wait and to hope for, to expect. So essentially, David is in the pit, but he's not just waiting, he's being expectant. He's placing his hope in God, and he's seeking the Lord. And what does the Bible say about seeking? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, when we seek him with all of our heart, we will find him. So the key in those moments is to draw near to Jesus and to place our hope in him. And the second key is to wait patiently. It says, David waited patiently for the Lord. So this implies that it probably took a long time for that deliverance to actually take place. And who knows that it doesn't take a lot of patience to, it doesn't take an exercise of patience when we see the end result, when the end result is sort of imminent. I mean, maybe some of us could use a little bit more patience when we're, you know, stuck in traffic. But for most of us, an exercise of patience is required when we don't see the end result, when we don't know how the process is going to go and how long it's going to take. We don't see the end in sight. And sometimes we get stuck in this pit for a very long time. Sometimes it's a few weeks. Sometimes it's months, sometimes it's literally years, and we just feel like we're stuck. And you may ask, why, why am I in this pit right now? Why is God allowing this to happen? Why am I waiting? But what I believe is that as we're waiting, there's a few things. God, it's an opportunity for, for, for us to draw closer to God. It's also an opportunity for us to learn and to grow. Maybe it's a, an opportunity to learn a skill, grow in skill or grow in character. And maybe God is actually preparing you for what's next. So I think there's a very certain purpose in waiting. 
And how do we wait patiently? And how do we wait actively? I think there are a few practical things, and that's what I would like to leave with you. The first thing is having a strong prayer life, a consistent prayer life where you're in constant communion with God, in constant conversation with God, where you're bringing your needs to him. The second thing is filling your heart with scripture, reading the word, studying the word, allowing Jesus to reveal himself through scripture to you. The third thing is worship. I'm a worship leader, and I believe that our number one calling is worshiping God, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our situation. The fourth thing is surrounding yourself wisely with good people, people who are godly, people who are firm in their convictions, people who can come alongside you in these moments of waiting. And finally, filling your heart with scripture that ties back to God's promise. One of those scriptures that I love is Isaiah 40, 31. It says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And you know, waiting is never pleasant. Definitely not pleasant. But as we go through these trials and as we choose to apply these principles and these behaviors to our lives, I believe that can sustain us through the waiting and through the trial. Which leads me to my final thought, and that is the last element that I want to point out in this passage, which is David's testimony. So it says, if we go back to the end of verse 3, it says, God put a new song in David's mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And then it says, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. So what does that mean? It means that as we go through trial, as we get delivered, as we're waiting patiently for the Lord, as we get delivered, and then as we express our praise, hopefully it doesn't stop there for us. But hopefully that situation that you went through, this trial that you went through, Hopefully, now that's an opportunity for you to bring glory to God. And now that situation has become your testimony. And that testimony is an opportunity for others to be drawn closer to Jesus. And so what I'd like to close with is, I don't know, I don't know what your version of the pit looks like. It might be different for you than it is for me. But I do believe that there's purpose in the trial. I believe there's purpose in the waiting. And on the other side of that waiting, if you do the waiting well, there's praise. And that praise is an opportunity to draw others closer to Jesus. Thank you, church. I hope that was encouraging. And with that, I'd like to invite Danae to the stage. Please welcome Danae. Thank you so much, church. Let's give him a hand yet again. Hi, church. My name is Danae, and I want to begin by telling you a story, and if you know it, you can join in. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. (laughs) Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. You see, Humpty Dumpty is a nursery rhyme, and it was believed to be about a king, and yet... This king wasn't able to be put back together, even after he fell. You see, the psalm that I'm going to talk about actually reminded me about this nursery rhyme. So that's a little weird, but here we are. (laughs) You see, to me, when I was reminded about this nursery rhyme, it presents an image that although people can be viewed as superior, whether it be their expertise or their placement in society or whatever it is, They are still limited by their human experience because they're within the boundaries of time, space, and matter, which is under the authority and also created by God alone. So what does that mean for us? It means we need to trust in God because he has and is and will continue to reign forever. The title of my message is Put Not Your Trust in Princes which is the title of Psalm 146. So I thought I would read it. It's just 10 verses. It's pretty quick, but I, I can't, I can't over, over uh, pass just all these scriptures. I think it's important. Um, so it'll probably pop on your screen. And again, you can join along if you'd like. 
Uh, it's taken from the ESV version. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, but in the, in not in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, when you read the psalm, I don't know if you felt the same way, but there are two things that pops out. It says, put not your trust in princes, because the Lord will reign forever. You see, the most superior people on earth cannot save you or me. They cannot even save themselves. And again, as I kept reading over this psalm, there was a phrase that came to mind, and it's from the New Testament, so I had to kind of Google it because I didn't know the full thing. <laughs> it's taken from Matthew 27, 42, and it recounts the day Jesus was nailed to the cross and how princes, in this case, the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him and said, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now on the cross, and we will believe in him. Well, let's see about this. These men's words and their plans perished. But Jesus did not. Jesus, who is God, came down from heaven, experienced all human temptations, willingly surrendered, perfectly sinless, carried out the will of the Father, crucified, paid for our sins, died and rose on the third day, is currently reigning over all. God's plan prevailed through death. It did not perish. So what does that tell us about God? As we continue to read the psalm, you, you see that God is all powerful, supreme in everything, and is our only salvation. You see, unlike us, God is not limited to the conditions of time and space and matter, like I mentioned a few moments ago. His plans are unaffected by his created works of heaven and earth and all that is in them, like it says in verse, verse 6. You see, as we continue to read the psalm, and I hope that you go back to it because it's a powerful one. Um, verse 5, it says, Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord is God. Well, today we just sang that song, and there was a phrase to it. You see, I wanted to learn what it meant to be blessed. I wanted to learn why, why it said God of Jacob. And so I did a bit of research, and this is what I found. The term blessed means receiving God's favor regardless of the circumstances and anything that draws us closer to Jesus. To me, it makes me think whether in hard times or not, if we see God as our only source of hope and help, we will see God's favor. And the phrase, the God of Jacob, symbolizes a window of hope because in the end, God touched Jacob's heart. God gave him a new name, Israel, even though he was imperfect. Isn't that amazing? The next time you sing the song, same God, that, let that like, kind, of, kind of ruminate, I don't know what the word is, but just let it sit with you. And as, as I kept continuing to read this psalm, between verses 7 to 9, it shows how God provides deliverance, not just spiritually, but mentally and physically. He's the only true source of deliverance. The world will offer you counterfeits, but they are not the true God. They're not the true deliverance. They may provide temporary solutions, but you don't know what doors are opening, so go to Jesus. He will provide you deliverance. And as we continue to read the verses 7 to 9, hopefully they pop up. If not, that's okay. I know there was a lot. Um, it shows that God provides in practical ways. He gives food. He cares for those. He cares for the widow and the fatherless. 
and he executes true justice. You see, this entire psalm describes the character of God, his essence, who he is. He's so powerful. And Psalm 145, I know that I'm not talking about it, but I had read it right before, and it said his greatness is unsearchable. Think about that. That's a difference between us and God. His greatness is unsearchable, which means he reigns over all. So what does that mean for us, and what does that look like now that we know this information? If we didn't know before, or we needed to be reminded about it. Well, you see, we can use the psalm in our prayer life to help our heart match our mind. You see, you can know it. You can know that God is your only hope. You can know that he's your only salvation. You can know that he's your only help. But if your heart is not submitted to the truth, then you just know it. You see, we learned a few weeks ago that if we pray the Psalms, it's kind of like a prayer coach. So praying the Psalm aloud can help our heart be in submission to the truth of who God is. And the way we see God is how we will be able to continue through life, no matter the circumstances. So as I continue to talk more about this, I I just wanted to highlight Hebrews 4.12, where it says the word of the Lord is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the soul and of the spirit, through the flesh and of the marrow, and a discerning of the hearts and mind. If we know that the word of the Lord is alive and powerful, then we can use it as we pray. And so if you're not used to it, I get it. When I was really little, my mom and would make us, uh, me and my siblings, before we go to school, pray scripture out loud. And I had no idea what it meant. I had no idea. I just did it. And yet I had to learn about it. And I learned it was powerful. So if that's your first time today and you go home, well, here's just a few examples. But you should look for yourself in Psalm 146. And whatever feels right, you should say it. So here's an example. This is something I would do. I'd say, dear Lord, you said in Psalm 146, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Lord, open my eyes spiritually. Dear God, you said in Psalm 146, blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob. Well, Lord, you are my help. Just as you are the God of Jacob then, You are my God. Help me to see your favor in this situation and trust you because I know you will reign forever and therefore you will reign over this situation. Use scripture in your prayer walk. You see, I can tell you I used to trust more what people had to say than God. In my case, it wasn't that I didn't believe that there is a God. It's just that I saw those superior to me um, or experts like doctors as holding all the truth and the power. You see, within a seven-year period, being told by doctors on five separate occasions that my mom would die within a short time frame, having seen her go through ovarian surgery due to her diagnosis of ovarian cancer, to then being in medically induced coma for two months because she had an unknown infection and compounded with sepsis, then her organs were failing and she had fluid building in her chest. They had told my family and I on three separate occasions, we've done all that we can. Please prepare for her passing. And yet two months later, she was healed by God and God alone. God is your help. The story doesn't stop there. Two years later, she was diagnosed with brain cancer. So she had to do brain surgery. And if anyone knows about open brain surgery, it's a very difficult and dangerous surgery. And yet, she came out untouched. Amazing. Within a seven-year period, she had completed 24 rounds of chemo. I had to learn to trust God. At first, I couldn't see where he was in it. Why is this happening to my mom? Why is this happening to me? Where are you, God? You see, through the years, God changed me. I saw God as my only hope and help and one who heals. He showed me kindness and care through those seven years. I can't explain all of it because we'll be here for a long time. But I can tell you, and I'm certain that I've seen it. You see, by the fifth time, doctors had told my family and I, My mom only had two weeks to live. In January 2021, I decided I'm not going to trust them. I'm going to trust God. I decided to trust God that he was going to do a new thing. I allowed my heart to match my mind, and I used scripture in that. So when the world told me otherwise, I relied on God and God alone. 
So you see, after 28 days later, after my mom was first rolled into a hospice, unable to move due to immense pain, after doctors had said that she had only two weeks to live because the cancer had spread all over her body, my mom walked out of a hospice center. <laughs> Amen. She was the first person to walk out of that facility. I can tell you they were all very confused because they've never had this happen to them. You see, four months later, my mom went to be with the Lord on his time and not princess. Glory to God. Remember, the Lord will reign forever. He reigned before you were formed in the womb. He reigns in all circumstances, and he will continue to reign even after. So put not your trust in princes, but in God alone, for the Lord will reign forever. Church, that is my encouragement for you today. I'm so excited to bring up our next speaker, Andrew Kumbina. I met him five years ago. He's great. I'm excited. Take it away, Andrew. Thank you. Come on, can we give a hand to Danae? How incredible was that? Um, when Danae and I actually joined church here in Toronto, we were a part of Serge and Catherine's Connect Group, so it's so cool to be up here. I'm speaking the word today with you guys. That was so good, guys, Serge and Danae. So I'm going to do my best. <laughs> All right, let's go to Psalms 8. I want to read out of Psalms 8. Psalms 8, verse 1. We'll read a couple of verses, jump around. So verse 1, it says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth, you have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, verse 4, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Verse 9, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And you know, the King James Version uses a word I like, and it says, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Isn't that so amazing? And I'm really glad that as a church, we've been looking at the Psalms this month. You know, these words from David really put into context and into perspective the kind of relationship that we can have with our God. David writes, oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You know, this is David pre-ancient times, in biblical times, right, with the naked eye, with no telescope, just looking up, walking up, looking at the sun, the stars and the moon, and declaring, oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. For us now, we, today, we know so much more, right? With the science and technology, we've got this recognition and understanding of creation that David would not have had. But just imagine that revelation and the understanding and passion that he had for God to know that I'm looking around and God, I see you there. You know, David is saying that as I, as I look at the stars, the sun and the moon, they declare the glory of God. The psalm begins and ends with him saying that God's name is visible in all the earth. You see, what that means is that it is proper to point to a star and say, I see God there. You see, there's an example. When an art expert looks and sees a painting and says, that's Picasso, right? He isn't saying that the painting and Picasso are one and the same. But what he is saying is that in the painting, he can see the handiwork and the craftsmanship, and, and he's able to identify that that is Picasso. And that is exactly what David is doing. He's looking around, looking around him, looking around creation and saying, I see God there. Amen. And so the first point for today is open your eyes and see God. Open our eyes and see God just as David did. I'm going to give you an example. I love sports, every single sport. I'm not a sport guy. <laughs> and um, if you were to go with me to a baseball game, you know, I, I would be so enamored. And let's say you knew nothing about baseball, right? We'd be watching the game, and I'd be like, that's the first baseman. That's the second baseman, the third baseman. And the pitcher's pitching, and oh, he pitched so fast. He pitched a curveball. And you see, I'm going on right now, right? <laughs> and you'll be sitting next to me like, Andrew, 
we've been watching this for two hours. Nobody has moved. Like, they are just standing there, <laughs> right? And in the same way, we might go to an art uh, museum. And I might just use that as a great opportunity to get some steps in, some exercise. <laughs> Meanwhile, you, maybe an art fanatic, you know, would be walking around and being like, that's Picasso, Andrew, that's Picasso, right? And what happens is, this is what we see with David. He's got that passion. He's got that revelation in his heart, looking around him, walking around and saying, I see God there. And I just want to encourage us today that when we read the Psalms, when we read that there, that we should also, that if we can also get that revelation in our heart and passion that David did, to look around and to see God in everything and be like, I see God there. Amen? All right, so next, I want us to look at Luke 11, verse 1 to 2. And this is the Lord's Prayer. And I read verse 1 and 2. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so the disciples, they're living life, walking with Jesus, right? And they see him praying, having a relationship with God, and they're like, I want that as well. And what I just find so incredible when we look at Psalm 8 is Jesus teaches them to do exactly what David was doing. David didn't need Jesus to tell him, but he got that revelation in his heart, right? And I just think that is so incredible that, Jesus, that David was praising the Lord and exalting him even before Jesus gave us that direction, all of us that direction on how to pray, right? It's to lift God up first, to exalt him. Amen? Now, what does it mean to say, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Uh, I think there's a lot that can be said about this, and I'm just going to key in on one little aspect of it. And to do so, let's go to Revelations 4, verse 8. And the book of Revelations was written by John. And what it is is that John has a vision. He gets revelation, and he's instructed to write it down. And, and that's what we read when we read Revelations. And we're going to uh, chapter 4. And John, I can't read it all because I, I wish I could read it all, uh, but I'll just paraphrase it. John is, he has the vision, and he sees, he's taken up into heaven, and he sees the throne, you know, with emerald and just beauty all around, and there's 24 elders, and then he sees heavenly beings, heavenly creatures, just magnificent, all surrounded around the throne of God. And we're going to read from verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Amen. 24-7, day and night, they never stop. In verse 9, I don't think they have it up there. That's my bad. But I'm just going to read as well, verse 9 and 10. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him. That's every single time. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So I read that and I just think, Wow. Do you, do you feel that as well? Like, wow, God is being praised. God is being exalted 24-7. Right now, as I speak to you, he's being exalted. And that brings me to my second point. It is a privilege and an honor to worship God. You see, just as we've read, heavenly beings, heavenly creatures, he sits on the throne in heaven, and he's being exalted. But he invites us as well to join in on that. What a privilege and an honor it is that we can as well lift up God's name here on earth. And that's what David says, right? That's what David says in Psalms 8. Who is man? Who are we that you are mindful of us? God is so mindful of us, guys. He's so, so mindful that he would invite us to also say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, you and I can try all our life to try and get into Prince Charles, you know, 
face to face with Prince Charles and it will never happen, right? You've got to go through security or you've got to win like a Nobel Prize or something, right? To get into Prince Charles and just be like, hey, Prince Charles, you're amazing. You're so cool, right? Only certain people have that privilege to be able to enact that access, but not with our God, guys. Our God is not exclusive as earthly kings and earthly rulers are, but he invites us openly, fully to be able to encounter him. Amen. You know, if you got an email from the White House <laughs> inviting you, right? If you got an email from the White House inviting you to go see the president, your ticket would have been bought yesterday, right? You would get your nicest suit, put it on, make sure that you look great, go into the White House and be, take photos for Instagram and be like, hey, it's me with my homie. Got a, do we have a photo? Me with my homie. <laughs> me with my homie Biden at the White House, hashtag, Right? <laughs> If you got an invitation, you would make sure you took care of that opportunity, and you would tell everyone over and over for the rest of your life, yep, I was at the White House. All right, we can take that down. (laughs) (laughs) Right? And what I want to highlight by that is we've got that invitation, guys, every single day. We've got that invitation to access the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who sits on the throne, and he's being worshiped and praised in heaven. Let's take opportunity of that. Let's not take that for granted. And sometimes I feel, sometimes I feel that we can get um, comfortable or just in a routine and get normalized with that. But no, guys, David gives us that example. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. And this brings me to my last point. When we worship God, we fulfill our purpose. When we gain perspective of who God truly is, that he indeed sits on the throne, that he's being praised right now as I speak to you. He's being exalted in heaven. When we get this revelation and passion for everything that God is, our lives become better because because that's the perspective that we live our lives from and everything changes. You see, David went through, as Serge spoke about, David went through so many trials and tribulations in his life. He was made fun of, he was forgotten about. When they came to look for to select a king amongst so many brothers of his, he wasn't even brought out. He was forgotten about, he was chased, trying to be, um, Saul wanted to kill him and murder him for years, right? But through that all, David did, did not make it about his circumstances because he had the perspective of who holds it all, of who created it all. And I just feel that David in speaking that throughout his life, throughout his circumstances, in speaking that, God, I see you everywhere, that enables him to have that perspective when the challenging times come. Lastly, I want to leave us with this. David had that revelation and passion of of who God was, but he didn't just stop there, he expressed it. And that's what I love so much about Psalms 8, right? David put pen to paper. He put pen to paper, and now today, you and I, We can get revelation from that. We are getting encouraged from that, from reading that. And I just want to encourage us, you know, I know that even for myself that I know that God is good and I know who he is and what he is, but, you know, sometimes we may just keep that to ourselves. But if David kept that to himself, we wouldn't be able to read about it today. And I just feel that, you know, for generations to come, for your own family, for your friends, right, if you would just express and change your conversations, for me, if, if you were to be like, hey, Andrew, how you doing? I'd be like, good, I'm good, I'm doing great, right? But what if I can change my vocabulary and be like, I'm blessed, God blessed me today. I woke up and God is great, right? If we can just change our vocabulary and express that we see God everywhere, that I see God there, that's what we were created for. When we worship God, we fulfill our purpose. Amen? Amen. If you would stand with me. You know, every time we gather as a church, we want to take a moment and give you the opportunity to consider where you are with God. The thing is, you and I, being human, none of us are perfect. We've made choices and decisions that have separated us from God. And this is why from the beginning, of human existence. God has been relentlessly pursuing us, 
relentlessly pursuing us to bring us into right standing with him. And I've just spoken about this incredible God, this magnificent God who sits on the throne and who is being exalted and praised 24-7. And at the same time, he's also a loving father, dear to us. He cares about us. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that if you would believe, that you would not perish but have life everlasting. That's our loving Father. He loved you and I so much that no matter what decisions we made, we can find healing, we can find restoration, we can find peace, we can find life in Him by accepting His one and only Son that He sent for us. So I wanna give you that opportunity today. If it's for the first time, that you want to say yes to God. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to live my life with you and for you. I want to live my life where I have that perspective of you as my guide, of you as my safe place, of you as my leader. And if you've made this decision before, but you've walked away from God, turned away from God, you can also make that decision today to choose God as number one in your life. There's no greater decision that you can make, church, than to live with God and to enter each day with him, to live a life like David did, where your perspective about your life on earth comes from constant revelation from God himself. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? I'm going to ask you in a moment to lift your hands if you want to make this decision to have a personal relationship with God for yourself. And this is not to embarrass you. It's not to shame you. It's a moment of liberty. It's a moment of freedom. It's a moment to choose and to know God for yourself just as he desires for you to know him. So I'm going to count to three. If you want to make this decision, why don't you lift up your hand? One, two, three. It's a moment of liberty. It's a moment of freedom. It's a moment to say, I choose you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And we're going to say a prayer. And the whole church is going to pray this with you. Repeat after me, dear Jesus, thank you for your love and grace. I know that I have made choices and decisions that have separated me from you. I'm sorry, and I trust that you will forgive me. I accept your love and grace. I ask you to be Lord and my Savior. Help me to believe in you. Help me to love you. Help me to see you. Help me to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen.